I'm going to be the moderator this afternoon. We're going to have got uh, three groups. I've got uh, Keith from Near Space, Near Space Ventures, and we've got uh, Larry Noble from EOSS and myself from Project Traveler. Uh, I've got about four or five uh, hydrogen launches under me. Keith, uh, oh, a dozen, a, a dozen, and uh, EOSS. Someone told me dozens, right? How many EOSS hydrogen? Oh, okay, Does, <laughs> dozen, dozen and a half or so. So I think everyone's relatively new to it. Am I ringing? I, I can't no. tell. Okay. Um, everyone's uh, relatively new to this, but that's kind of the nature of this beast, unfortunately. Um, so let's get started. I've got a few slides to go through, and then we'll start the actual discussion. Uh, hydrogen versus helium, uh, this was uh, some stuff that I had put together a couple of years ago. Uh, I presented, I think it was in Omaha, uh, kind of the first little foray at uh, hydrogen for us. Uh, fundamentally, it's the same. I mean, it's a compressed gas, comes in a compressed gas cylinder, has a very similar lifting uh, ratios, capacities, uh, same pressures. Uh, the only difference is one, you can light a match at and the match goes out, and the other, you light a match and the match doesn't go out. Um, the CGA 350, the hydrogen is, that's what uh, the hydrogen cylinders use, and uh, here's a photo of it down here. Uh, it's a real small nipple, and then it's a reverse thread. And so what we've done is uh, purchased an adapter, that small bottom piece, and adapted uh, the 580 hydrogen to 350 uh, inert gas. No, the other way around. Other way around. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm reading it. I'm reading it from the way the nipples are. Okay, the 350 to the 580, which goes this way. Uh, yeah, the 350 uh, for the hydrogen um, over to the inert gases. Uh, and this is, we happen to be using a nitrogen regulator. Uh, so that's, that's what we've done. Uh, hydrogen is flammable, but I want to remind you of this. When a typical cylinder is filled to its design pressure of 2400 PSI, it will contain almost 300 cubic feet of atmospheric pressure gas, or about 160 times the internal volume of the cylinder. This compression of gas represents a tremendous amount of stored energy. If the outlet valve is broken off, the sudden release of compressed gas can turn the cylinder into a missile with energy to shoot through a cinder block wall. In one reported incident, a damaged cylinder penetrated two sheet metal walls before becoming airborne and exiting through the roof. The tank reached an altitude of 140 feet before falling back through the building's roof a second time. When a steel cylinder becomes a projectile, it can move with great force, at high speeds, and in unpredictable directions, with the potential to cause serious or fatal injuries. But that's any cylinder. That's not just related to hydrogen. Uh, right, and that, that was the point, that the hydrogen is flammable, and that can be bad. But the safety goes beyond just the flammable gas. It goes to any, anything that you're dealing with these uh, high-pressure cylinders. You know, that, that goes back to the basic things, like keep the cap on it, lay it over on the ground when you're filling it, um, transportation issues, all that sort of stuff. So, All right, so here's the rules. Uh, each group, which would be uh, EOSS, uh, Near Space, and uh, Project Traveler, give an opportunity to show uh, their filling apparatus. Now uh, we'll go around each uh, group and uh, ask a set of predetermined questions. We've got, uh, we've got, uh, I think, basically 15 questions to go through, and uh, I ask the audience to um, to hold their questions till we get to the end. Because, like I said, we've got some pre-canned questions that are going to try to dig up a lot of the issues that we've got going. And then uh, after we get through that, then whatever gaps we've left, uh, we'll, try to, uh, we'll try to make it up as we go. And if we have time, uh, you guys can come up. I'm not sure we're running a little bit behind schedule now, so we'll see how, it, how this goes. So first question is, what apparatus do you use to fill your balloons? And I guess I'll just let uh, Keith start. This is kind of the show and tell portion. And uh, well, we let you have it. Almost everybody else starts out with a helium regulator. 
And uh, all we did is buy the adapter nipple for it and then adapt, adapt the connector. We have a couple of different uh, killer <coughs> connections for the, for the balloons because you don't know what size you're getting. And some of the new Chinese ones have that really large mouth on it. You have to wrap a bunch of tape around it. <coughs> so we, we bring a couple of them along just in case whatever we're doing isn't working. The biggest difference is we move from a rubber hose to a, a steel hose. The steel hose um, was a secondary change. We weren't going to change to this, but I did four launches for the Boy Scouts last summer and I had to justify the program to be an official Boy Scout program for the safety reasons. And so one of the things I uh, chose to do was order a new set of Sorry about that. I, I can hold it if you want. Is to order a new set of hoses. And the hoses I chose to order were the steel type hoses. You can arguably lay it on the ground and then ground it out if you want to. You can actually drive a, a U-shaped uh, spike through it and that way it's grounded to the, to the ground at the same time. The other thing I did at the same time is I switched over to quick disconnects. Um, Somebody was telling me that they thought those might even be more dangerous than just screwing it on every time, but the convenience of them outweighed anything else that I thought. So that's what we use for our connect. That's what we use for our apparatus. Okay, I'm Larry with Edge of Space Science. Uh, let me give you a quick background. Um, I became the balloon fill guy because our previous balloon guy had a had an accident and. Uh, not, not with the balloon, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a completely separate thing. It was when he was uh, in Nebraska. So uh, he was injured and so uh, I kind of took over as temporary balloon fill guy and uh, I'm still temporary because I like chasing. But anyway, so I kind of took over what was already in existence and what they had developed and uh, they had, uh, you know, success with about 130 different balloon flights. So I figured, well, I'm not going to argue with success. Um, apparently, from what I learned from our history, uh, we did used to use regulators. Um, however, they discontinued because they had problems with those, um, apparently freezing up and causing issues. So uh, we also needed to fill balloons fast and furious. And I know that's kind of different from what uh, Kmont was teaching us today. They want slow fills. But the reason fast and furious is these are 3,000 gram balloons. Sometimes I have to fill three balloons. We'll, fill, we'll do three flights all pretty much at the same time. And we also have constraints with the FAA in that we have to be down on the ground before too late because all the incoming stuff to DIA airport. So I don't have a lot of time to sit there and, and slowly fill balloons. And, um, so at one point, Merle, our previous guy, actually made a manifold where he could connect three helium cylinders and fill fast because you didn't have to change the apparatus from cylinder to cylinder. So when we um, went to hydrogen, I did a lot of research on the internet, read a lot of articles. I'm sure you guys probably have done the same thing. And of course, everything talks about regulators because of the safety with the uh, with the cylinder and um, we had a big discussion um, I think we need to get a regulator I think that is a mistake that we made especially after talking to Mike Morgan and the success that he had with his regulator as far as filling fast and furious he says he can empty a cylinder in five minutes if he needs to so because I need I need volume to fill these balloons quick I can't uh, take forever. So uh, we haven't been using a regulator. I think that's something that we're going to change. But there's one thing that um, our previous balloon guy came up with, and uh, this is something that I think is, is great, because we used to use uh, tubes similar to what you've got there for different size balloons. And uh, what they came up with is a nozzle. Here is a nozzle. Right there, it's just a piece of PVC. And there is a, um, a groove that's machined into it with a lathe for the hose clamp. And so we usually fly 3,000 gram uh, Totex. 
that's our balloon of choice because we, we hang 28 pounds on the, the neck of those for a lot of times. So when you've got that much up pressure, it's hard to hold on to it. So we would insert a piece of PVC into the neck and then we would uh, put this nozzle in here. So here's, here's a, a display right there. So you, got, you can squeeze onto that and hold without crushing the neck and reducing the flow. And uh, this part here is where the, the payload hangs from. And it just uses a half inch national pipe thread uh, plug. So our fill apparatus is designed with half inch male national pipe threads. We've got a swivel that allows that to be screwed on and off. At first we, uh, we had to twist the hose, screw it on and unscrew it. Of course that got difficult once the, uh, the cooling and the hose is frozen, but our little swivel works out really, really good. So, uh, so that's what we've got. And so we adapt all of our nozzles for various balloons so that it uses that uh, half inch. Um, so the other end, of course, we already explained the non-regulator. There, of course, is the fitting for the hydrogen. And the valve, which is, of course, a high-pressure valve to handle the 2,400 pounds. Um, the reason for that is we're switching cylinders. And, of course, once the balloon, you get that first cylinder in there, it's stretchy. It wants to push out the hydrogen. So once you disconnect that from the cylinder, you're going to start getting a flow of hydrogen out of this part. So to minimize the flow of hydrogen going the opposite direction, we then close that valve, switch to another cylinder, and uh, start filling again. So uh, that's our fill mechanism. Now, when we went to, uh, started buying some of the, the Howie balloons, those have a huge, huge neck. And I hated those balloons at first. But the reason we went to those is we were having some problems uh, getting the, uh, the Totex balloons. So uh, I think that problem has been resolved, but that's why we decided to try the, the Howies. So one of our designers came up with these types of PVC things for the ad adapter, the nozzle. And uh, that was for the 1600 Howie. And he came up with this for the 3000 gram Howie. And um, that's really heavy, <laughs> and it's also awkward to work with, getting my, uh, my wrench in here between the eyes. And we thought, okay, falling back to ground, that could probably cause some damage or hurt somebody. I didn't like that, plus it was kind of expensive, and I ended up designing this one. And you're like, well, how does that fit into the Howie neck? Well, is what you do, of course, the Howie neck is huge, you just slide it on over that and you just pull the neck this way and then fold the neck around and the rubber on the Howie is really thick and heavy and so the pipe clamp or the you know the worm drive uh, hose clamp <coughs> clamps down around and in some places you've got four thicknesses of the balloon because you got that one fold and so that hose clamp goes into that groove created by the coupler and the uh, inch and a half adapter there. And so it, it crushes that neck and it seals it all up just great. And then we have our half inch and of course here's where we, uh, we hang the payload from. So this works very nice for the Howies and so that's what we've come up with. So that's our fill mechanism and how we do it. Uh, while we're on that, uh, we were talking about that uh, water thing that Noah used as far as how much uh, hydrogen you've got in the balloon, will it lift? Well, we used to have a sandbag, and I would get it all set up the night before and have it weighing the correct weight. Well, then I'd get out to the launch site, and the students had changed the weights of their payloads, so I would have to readjust the sandbag. That was hard to do on the fly. Plus, if I was flying three balloons, I had to have three different sandbags with differing weights. So I came up with this bag. 
Um, this right here starts at five pounds. So the carabiner and the bag are five pounds because we never fly anything less than that. This, of course, this carabiner clips into this string that we already showed you here. And, of course, my weight of my hose and so forth is a half pound, so I know that to deduct out of it. So I then have, uh, here's the five pounds pre-measured, three pounds, one pound, one pound. So I can very quickly on the fly add weights to the bag to come up with the exact lift weight of, uh, of what the balloon needs to lift. So I can do that very quickly. Um, for all the three different balloons that weigh differently, I can, uh, I can very quickly make those adjustments. <laughs> all right, well, um, we, uh, we did go to the regulator. Um, I'm, I'm personally not convinced it's uh, all that necessary. Uh, on the helium we flew for uh, years, uh, basically with the, what was it, the, the 580 fitting, uh, basically directly tied to a piece of, uh, of rubber hose. Uh, we use the, the reinforced nylon hose. It's uh, a lot more resistant to being crushed, you know, as it uh, gets kinked or, uh, you know, you tape around it. Uh, for, our, uh, for our filling, we basically lay this thing on the ground. We attach that to the uh, hydrogen or helium tank, and uh, then we just take the, the neck of the, of the balloon, kind of like uh, Larry was saying, we double it over. We're not flying the Hyoes, Hi Howies, Howies, the H1s. We fly the Caymans, uh, but uh, uh, we just take that thing, wrap it around, and uh, wrap a bit of duct tape around it, and uh, uh, we've never had uh, too much of a problem. We try and shove that up far enough into the neck so that it's uh, past the neck. Otherwise, you can get some weird stuff there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I'm sure some of you have found if your balloon twists and it twists off the, the, uh, the air supply separate from the envelope of the balloon, you get a really distorted-looking balloon and worse uh, very quickly. But uh, that's it. Uh, just a very simpler. This is a, a nitrogen regulator. And uh, when I was shopping for this thing, obviously your input uh, pressure is going to be, you know, a couple thousand pounds. Uh, but the outlet pressure, uh, that's a pretty good indication how much volume it's going to push through. Uh, I've never sat down with a t stopwatch and timed it, but uh, we seem to be able to dump, uh, you know, a couple hundred cubic feet in uh, uh, well under 15 minutes, probably about 10 minutes. So we're also concerned about uh, time. We do not like to fill slow, uh, as you guys are going to see tomorrow. Uh, Kansas winds are not very forgiving, and uh, we, we like to uh, get everything prepped, get uh, all the beacons tested, everything's good to go. We put the gas in the balloon, we attach the load line, and we get it off the ground. We do not like having a balloon hanging around. So that is our, uh, that's our apparatus. So that being said, we've got... Uh, basically 15 more questions here. And uh, I think we'll just kind of rotate who starts. So I'll start this next one. Um, does your group employ any special clothing or safety re equipment requirements for those filling the balloon? And the basic answer to that for us is no. Uh, we do have a uh, fire extinguisher, which I think is kind of alluded to in I think the next question. Uh, we do have a fire extinguisher. Um, we try to get the, uh, the cylinder on the ground, you know, grounded, if you will, but we do not stake it anymore. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, try to be aware of what kind of clothing, uh, you know, uh, cottons are good. Usually in the morning, it's, it's relatively humid, and so there's not a lot of, uh, cotton doesn't burn that well uh, in that kind of situation, but uh, that's pretty much it. So you might want to augment that question to also include procedures. We, and you're quick to, oh, that's we, we, We've got lots of questions, so they're going to kind of touch on some of that. You're quick to say no, but then again, I heard a lot of safety in there that... It's, yeah, it's, it's guidelines. Safe, this is about safety clothing, though, more than anything okay. else. Yeah, we don't use fireproof uh, gowns, um, safety glasses, things like that. It's, okay. it's pretty, pretty much standard clothing. Yeah, before uh, wildland firefighting, they invented Nomex. It was leather and cotton. So cotton does have a, uh, an inherent resistance to burn, although obviously cotton will burn eventually. 
So uh, our, our clothing that, that uh, I have is, you know, cotton, long-sleeved uh, shirt, cotton shirt, um, and cotton pants. Uh, no nylon or polyester because if that melts, it, when it burns, it'll melt and it'll stick to your skin and cause lots of problems. So I actually have a, um, a cotton long-sleeved uh, hoodie, and uh, I can slip that over whatever I'm wearing, and I wear a, uh, just a standard uh, baseball cap, and then the hoodie comes up over the back so it protects my head and neck, and uh, safety glasses are mandatory, of course, um, and we also have cotton gloves that uh, we wear at all times too. Well, unless we need some finger dexterity, but uh, that's to prevent, uh, obviously, some burning shards of latex falling or flash fire or something like that. So uh, that's the uh, clothing that our filler people have. NSV does the same thing pretty much. We use uh, cotton gloves. The only other thing I do is I make sure nobody's got a watch on or anything on there. Uh, if the ladies are there, I ask them to take off their rings because you don't want anything catching on your balloon. And when it was just helium, all you had to lose was the helium and the balloon, but now you could conceivably start a fire. So I try to make sure that there's no sharp objects uh, on their arms or on their fingers or actually on their clothing. I have a tendency to carry a little knife over here, so it's kind of important to keep that away from the area too. Anything that the balloon can get caught on is what I avoid. But to be honest, I haven't thought about anything else. That's all I've ever done. Uh, Larry, will let you start this off. Are there any other pieces of equipment available during a fill, for example, a fire extinguisher? Uh, yes, I actually have two different kinds of fire extinguishers. I, there's your standard ABC fire extinguisher, chemical dry, uh, dry chemical. I have two of these. And I also have, I don't know how many gallons it is, but the, the label says it's 24.5 pounds. But it's your a class A water fire extinguisher that's, uh, uh, you know, charged with just air, like an air compressor. Uh, several of the guys have those. We also have those because of the potential for other fires. Uh, in Colorado, there's a lot of fields, dry brush, uh, dry grass, cars are driving out there. Uh, if it's a dry season, fire restrictions, farmers, ranchers are a little reluctant to let us drive out there. So. If we have these water fire extinguishers, we can also use them to put out a, a grass fire. And if something happens to me and I'm on fire, I would really rather be put out with a water fire extinguisher than the dry chemical. So we've got that and uh, two of these as well. I, I kind of move them around a little ways, not uh, relatively close, but uh, I want people to be able to see those. I, I put little uh, cones, traffic cones, to mark where, there's, where those are at so other people can see where they're at and quickly grab those and use those to put out the fire. So we do have three. We don't uh, right, currently have anything. We don't use anything nearby. Uh, we keep uh, one small uh, uh, dry chemical uh, extinguisher with us. Uh, it's, it's a relatively new addition to the list, and I know there's been at least uh, one morning we got out there and was like, where's the fire extinguisher? Uh, it's in the garage. Yeah. I'm not sure, does. you know, if hydrogen were to catch on fire, it would, it would go up so quickly that it would burn itself out faster than you could ever get a fire extinguisher on it. So it would have to be for other things that might have started on fire. The latex will latex catch fire and come back down. Yeah, it can melt. Right. Yeah. Bur burning shards of latex may be coming down. You're right. Starting other things on fire. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. The, the hydrogen fire, you know, you're going to be shedding off the cylinder. Uh, it's going to be going up in the air. I really don't think the, we're going to put out the hydrogen anyway. The right. stop that would be to turn off the gas flow. Yeah, yeah if it was coming from the tank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hence the regulator. <laughs> All right. Uh, oops. I guess it's helpful if I turn it right side up. Uh, Keith, you want to take this number four? Uh, who is allowed in the vicinity of the balloon while being filled? Well, our group is pretty small, so generally it's uh, only two of us or three of us there in the, anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, at the moment, it pretty much takes three of us to get it, get it going upright, especially if you've got a couple people with gloves holding the balloon in place and one doing the actual fill part. So 
Um, we have not had a, an occasion to have more than that help anyway. Now, at the scout thing last year, I did. I had uh, four or five boys that would come up and helped out with the launches as well, and they were just given a quick walkthrough of what to do if anything did happen. But uh, other than that, we don't have that many people to worry about. Uh, we're kind of the same way. Uh, there's typically uh, uh, about uh, two to four of us that are uh, in the immediate vicinity. Uh, depending on the wind, uh, we may have some extra helpers, uh, you know, holding the balloon in place while it's uh, while we're topping it off. Uh, but that's pretty much the extent of it. We do actively try to keep uh, you know younger children away from the balloon uh, because of the fire risk. Uh, not so much worried about puncturing the balloon. I mean, we're obviously worried about that, but uh, just with a hydrogen. Uh, Factor we try to keep the children uh, away, but uh, that's that's the extent of our procedure. Uh, we generally have three separate areas. There's the launch area where we're actually going to go to to release the balloon. Uh, there's a payload prep area, which is again is completely separate from where the balloon fill area is. That's where students are. That's where. Uh, EOSS people are configuring our payloads and that is uh, some distance away from the balloon fill area because of the the hydrogen danger we want to keep the students away in fact the students are specifically told to stay away from that area depending upon our launch location uh, we have cones and some rope to kind of rope off the area to keep people out um, if we don't have a lot of people it's just uh, don't go over there and just stay away from that area. So uh, we try to keep most people away, but um, they're adults too. They know what's going on. If somebody wants to come over and watch, I'm not opposed to that as long as they understand they're doing so at their own risk. And that uh, kind of is related to this. What do you use to enforce that? You say rope. You We don't really have anything. Uh, I guess common sense would be what keeps most people away. And if you say hydrogen, most people it's kind of, oh, that, that works really good to keep people away from the balloon. Well, there does seem to be this misunderstanding that if you're using hydrogen and the balloon pops, it's automatically on fire. Yeah. Well, that isn't the case. I mean, something's got to start it. I mean, it, there's got to be a spark or a open flame involved. And, uh, uh, you know, so I just tell people to back off. Chances are it popped, it, it, the balloon popped, it didn't catch on fire in the first place. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting thing about Larry's process there, because that, that balloon is off in a corner there, and it is nowhere near the payload, and it is carried over and attached to the payload when it's time to launch. And that's a pretty key thing that happens uh, Larry's device. So it's, it's completely independent of the payload. It's 20 feet up. Yeah, because of our, you know, our nozzles, like I said, that, that fill is completely separate, and uh, we use these, uh, you know, quick links to attach everything together, and, you know, like uh, uh, it was talking about, they're all separate locations completely. Yeah, and if you're up 20 feet already or 30 feet already, the only thing that could be happening is a leak. Correct, and as soon as the balloon is full, we, we then raise it up on that initial flight line, and it's 20 feet up in the air. And you're right, if, it's all going to go up from there, if there is. But I think it's very safe at that point, in my opinion, once it's 20 feet up in the air. We then move to the launch area and the attachments made out there for the, uh, for the payload. Right. Small question, please. Um, in the event that the balloon does burst at ground level, but there's no source of ignition that you have to worry about actually inflating, um, what kind of time frame are you looking at for the dissipation of the hydrogen that's directly in the air? I mean, Second. I it's, it's a very light, so it's going straight up, but like, you really, it's, it's almost, uh, you don't really have to worry about it like, lingering around for a little while. And, it's not like natural gas. The, the, the hydrogen's going to go up faster than the balloon can go up, and it's climbing at 1,000 foot a minute. It has no load. There's nothing holding it back, no aerodynamic drag it's to space. speak of. It's just going to go woof. Um, and there's a YouTube video um, that I played a couple of years ago at uh, GPSL, and it shows when they, ign they intentionally ignited it. And basically the bottom of the balloon just kind of stayed put. The top of it went up, and then you had the, the burning latex coming back down. But you could basically see visually how quickly that was dissipating. 20 to 30 feet a second. 
Yeah. The only time it would be a factor is if you were filling indoors, like in an aircraft hangar or something like that. Then it could be trapped, and then you have a whole different situation. And helium doesn't have that issue at all, of course. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think who started? Is it my turn to start? Uh, I think it is. Question number six is a checklist used during the filling of a balloon. Uh, we do not have a specific checklist for filling, per se. Uh, we have a checklist that we use. Uh, it involves things like uh, powering on APERS-1, uh, verify APERS-1 is being received, uh, verify GPS lock on APERS-1, uh, power up APERS-2, you know, verify APERS-2 received, verify GPS lock, verify cameras you know, engaged, whatever. Uh, but that's it. Uh, the filling the balloon checklist is fill the balloon. Clearly, I need to write a list. <laughs> okay, we, uh, we have a checklist, and the first checklist included, you know, filling the balloon, you know, pilot balloons and time factors and so forth. But when we went to, uh, to hydrogen, uh, our checklist person didn't want to be around hydrogen in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> which is okay, I'm all right with that. And so the the lists kind of separated at that point. There was a balloon checklist, and then there was the, uh, the flight line checklist, and you know, checking for aircraft, and you know, things like that. Um, so we do have a checklist, but the balloon checklist was really so small that we've pretty much done away from a balloon fill checklist totally. Uh, I've done it so many times. Uh, and my assistants have done it so many times. We do not have a specific one for filling the balloon. Yeah, we are looking for a new volunteer temporary. A new volunteer temporary. <laughs> I think you kind of answered yours already. You don't yeah, have a checklist. We don't have a checklist. Shame on you. In, in my brain, in my head. <laughs> and then Deb says, "Oh, did you turn on the tracker?" Yeah, no. Yeah, when it's when it's rising. It's already going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number seven. Uh, uh, Larry, it's be for you. How many people are directly involved in the filling of the balloon, and what are their roles? Okay, well, there's the ideal number, and then there's the reality of how many I have. Okay, um, I like at least two people, me and an assistant, but there's been times where uh, I don't even have that. But I do have to have somebody that's opening and closing and moving the cylinders, uh, you know, the fill tube from cylinder to cylinder. So I really need at least two people, myself and at least one other person. Ideally is what I would like, is one person manning the, the cylinders, uh, me under the balloon filling, an assistant with me under the balloon filling, and I like to have a safety person. That's the person that may actually be holding a fire extinguisher or they're kind of monitoring what's going on, uh, making sure that... Uh, people are doing what they're supposed to be. If somebody starts approaching, they can you know, talk to that person, what's going on, things like that. So I like at least four people. If, if we're under a windy conditions where that balloon is starting to flop around before fill, I do need some people to come in with the cotton gloves and prevent that balloon from flopping over and popping on the ground. So that kind of varies depending upon the, uh, the winds. So anywhere from two to maybe seven people. Traditionally, uh, we don't have enough people to, to, to make a difference, so there's three of us. But uh, when we do other types of launches, like at scouting events, which is where we do quite a few of them, I actually involve as many kids as I absolutely can, as, as opposed to doing, what do they call it? where you just let it go. We quiesce the balloon into the air by running uh, some lines down to the ground. So if I have a lot of kids to entertain, I will usually put out four to six of those so that all these kids are holding on to part of the balloon. Now, and then to fill it itself, to actually do the fill, I'm just using one person on the tank and then two or three, four if I can find them, if I have that many people available, to be balancing the balloon out. So there's one fill, one tank person, at least one person with gloves on to, to balance the balloon, and then as many others as I can round up because we're really putting a show on. We're not, I'm not trying to make it difficult or make them think it's a scary thing. I want them all to have a part of it. So I involve as many people as I can. 
we are kind of in the same boat uh, in the sense that uh, we have, we barely have enough people. Uh, there's typically, ideally, I like about three plus handlers uh, to, to hold the balloon. I like one person on the neck, uh, actually, you know, um, holding on to it, keeping it from going anywhere. I like one person on the tank, uh, you know, to, to shut off that gas if we have an issue, to, you know, uh, adjust the regulator, whatever needs to happen. And uh, then we like to have a, a, a third person down underneath the balloon uh, assisting, you know, uh, getting the duct tape, uh, getting the, uh, the tie wraps, uh, you know, we have wire cutters under there to, to trim off the neck on the on the wire cutter on the tie wraps. So uh, it's it's good to have two people. Uh, sometimes we use uh, um, latex or vinyl gloves. Uh, other times we don't. We've kind of been getting away from that, honestly. And uh, if you want to borrow some gloves, I have a lot of extras. <laughs> you have a lot of extras. Well, yeah, I I I have them. I I lug them out to the to the launch site, but I'm. Well, I, I, have, I have some opinions on that. But anyway, um, so yeah, usually one of those persons does, regardless of what the rest of the group is doing, one of those people does not have um, uh, gloves on to be able to handle that duct tape because duct tape and latex gloves, um, it's not, it doesn't work. I'm not too worried about handling the, the uh, neck of the balloon either without gloves on. I'd rather have my hand on that because with the gloves on, it's a little bit slippery mm -hmm. and without them, you can hang on to that, that rubber a little bit better. And because that neck is so much thicker, I'm not at all worried about... I've, I've never had a neck burst. Yeah. All right, uh, number eight, how is the neck sealed off after filling? And I don't know who's starting this time. You'll start? Okay, I kind of explained that already um, with our half inch national pipe threads. We just put a, uh, put a plug into it. Uh, this was our, uh, our nozzle for the uh, Totex 1200 gram balloons, much smaller. And we just use a, uh, a little plastic wrap, tie wrap, instead of a hose clamp for the, uh, for the Totex 1200. So, so there it is uh, attached to a, to a balloon neck. And again, there's the plug. And of course, like I explained, the payload string hooks onto there. We, uh, we pretty much do like, the only way I knew how to do it for a long time is we fold the neck in half and uh, of course the, the line is already attached. We fold the neck in half and wrap it real hard with uh, duct tape. That's all we've done most of the time. Uh, we tried using the tie wrap one time. Uh, what I was afraid of is that tie wrap is kind of a hard piece of plastic and I didn't want the balloon flopping around and hitting it and then destroying all the work you've done so far, not to mention the cost. So I don't do the tie wraps. They're just, to me, too, uh, too dangerous as far as the balloon is concerned. Uh, I think uh, Ryan had a shot of uh, one of my fills. I'm pretty sure that was my photo. Uh, but we use the, the still uh, welded uh, rings, get them from Hobby Lobby. It's kind of a brass colored. Uh, we slip the neck through that and double it over. The first thing we do is we put uh, two uh, good tie wraps on it. We prefer the ones with the, the steel uh, kind of spring thing to, to hold it in place. Uh, sometimes those are easier to find than others, but uh, we usually put two on there. We put those on because they're, they're quick and they're easy and they're gonna get that thing sealed off. We're not gonna vent any gas and the thing's not going anywhere. We don't trust those things at altitude, so then we wrap that uh, with tape, again, to kind of protect it from coming back and hitting the balloon, but also to, uh, the duct tape seems to work at altitude. Uh, uh, NASA got that one right. <laughs> Question nine, uh, how and when is the flight string attached to the balloon envelope? Okay, we uh, again have uh, three spots, the balloon fill spot, the payload prep area, and then the flight area. So. The, the balloon is brought out to the launch area and the payload string is brought out to the launch area and that's where the two are connected together with a, uh, with a quick link. And that's done just right before launch. It's like the last thing uh, other than check for aircraft and then we fly. We use, we use carabiners as well. They're, they're not connected to the balloon until the package isn't connected to the balloon until we're ready to go. Then we generally walk the balloon over to wherever the package has been pre-staged, connect the two carabiners together. They're the little ones, they're not the big ones. 
and put little carabiners together and off we go. Uh, I do something similar to that with that steel ring on the hanging on the bottom of the balloon. That gives a that's a handling ring. We can uh, walk the balloon out. Uh, we we prep all the payloads. They're all setting out, uh, all strung out in a row. Usually we'll use like the plastic tubs that we hold stuff in on. We'll set those things upside down or put the lids on. Have everything all stretched out. And then on the top of the parachute, we have the load line and we have a, a metal uh, clasp, like a dog leash uh, clasp, just the little spring loaded thing. We clip that thing on and we're ready to go. One thing I might want to say real quick is, because I think we passed this question already, I usually take a, uh, a length of that r rope that we're using for the downline and put it on the balloon even before we start to fill and with a slip knot. That way, if by some chance whoever's hanging onto the neck let go of it, I've never had to try this, but I'm hoping that the slip knot would catch fast enough and maybe we'd save the balloon. <laughs> but that becomes our tie down point eventually when that's up there anyway. We pull it down and then fold the thing over and wrap it. All right, uh, Keith, I guess I'll let you start. Uh, how are hydrogen cylinder, cylinders transported to the launch site and who transports those tanks? They're transported by me on the back of my uh, uh, SUV. The have, we have a, I have one of those platforms that connects into your trailer hitch and I lay it down in there and I strap it down real well. I usually uh, do more than just strap it. I try to uh, put it in the center or on one of the ends and then make sure it's not gonna roll in any way and then strap it down real hard and with actual mechanized straps so it can't move. I don't have the ability to transport, transport it standing up like you see usually on the back of trucks and such. So this is the safest way I can think of to do it. And it doesn't, the, the lip on the carrier is lower than where the uh, valve is on the tank. So I don't have to worry about any kind of even if it did break loose somehow, there's no way it's going to hit something that's going to break off that, that valve. Uh, typically, uh, typically, I'll wind up transporting them, and I'll, uh, I'll, we've got a six-foot trailer that I hook up to the back of the Jeep and uh, haul it. I like the, the luggage rack idea. I might have to try that when I return this last cylinder. But, um, yeah, we put it on the trailer, strap it down. Uh, if we have a pickup, we'll put it in the back of a pickup, but we'll not put it inside of any enclosed vehicle. Okay, we're unable to transport them sitting up vertically as well. Uh, that's just not practical for us, so they are laying down. Uh, I have to transport anywhere from five to seven cylinders because we have to have sufficient balloons and gas to do an additional balloon than what we're planning to fly because I've got, you know, 100 students out there uh, they've spent a lot of time. Uh, they can't come back another day. I, if we have a balloon failure, which we have had in the past, um, I have to have the ability to, uh, to back that up. So I have enough latex and gas to fill one more balloon beyond what I'm planning to fly. So I'm transporting anywhere from five to seven cylinders. If I'm flying three balloons, then I gotta have enough for four. So that's in excess of seven. You're looking at 10. So we have a trailer, flatbed trailer. Um, there's a, um, a two by 12 board that runs across to butt the cylinders up against to prevent them from moving forward during a panic stop or a collision. And they're secured with uh, copious amounts of straps. And then there's some cribbing, wooden cribbing that I'll put in there to make sure that there's no lateral movement of those cylinders and it's all strapped down with, uh, with ratcheting straps. So that's how we transport the cylinders. Now, there's one thing that I have been concerned about is, okay, how's the state patrol going to view all of this? And um, I, I wanna do this safe and appropriate. Now, while we don't necessarily have to abide by Department of Transportation regulations, I kinda try to do that to some degree for the most part. Uh, so when I get a delivery order for air gas, that's always with me. It's always with the gas in the vehicle that's pulling the trailer. So that if I get stopped by the state patrol or local sheriff or whatever, they're going to be curious as to what is this you've got, what's going on, what are you doing. I can explain to them, I can show them this. Um, 
There's also an emergency contact number. That, of course, is Chemtrex for all hazardous materials. That's nationwide phone numbers. Uh, so that's on this piece of paper. Also on the back of this delivery order from air gas is the uh, emergency response. Talks what the fire department's supposed to do, law enforcement's supposed to do, etc. So I always have this with me. Um, also this delivery order, air gas is expecting you to have the uh, material safety data sheet. Although I'm the only one that seems to be interested in that, nobody else in our group seems to care. But I do carry that in my book. Uh, so I've got the material safety data sheet in there. I've got uh, various information, and this is always with me too. So just in case I get stopped. Mm -hmm. And that's available on their website as a PDF. Right? Yes, yes, yes it is. But the state trooper, they feel better if you've got these types of things so they understand what you're transporting. So it's really more to show them. Uh, and so having a hard copy is much better out on the street than a PDF on a computer. All right, uh, I'll start this one. Uh, question 11, what, if any, post-fill procedures are employed? Uh, connect the balloon and get it off the ground, or collect the payload and get it off the ground. Pretty much the same here. We don't do anything special. Uh, get it off the ground is the goal, so we have to take apart all the equipment off of the tank, and I usually make sure the tank's secured before we leave, but that's it. Yeah, there's, uh, there's nothing special we do. Uh, there might be some residual hydrogen in the, uh, in the fill apparatus, but of course that dissipates quickly. So it's just a matter of picking up everything, resecuring the cylinders, and getting ready to go. Yeah, I guess I would add that uh, Post-fill, post-launch, uh, I will vent the cylinders completely, leave the valve open, and uh, totally get rid of that because it might be sitting in my garage till Monday till I can get it back. And a lot of times I will throw an empty cylinder in the back of the Jeep and leave the windows cracked. Um, it's easier to transport than the trailer, but uh, it's been venting overnight at that point. Now I will say, one time I vented a, a tank, and I forget what happened, but for some reason it possessed me to go just check that valve and it opened again and it started venting gas. So I don't know what that was all about. Um, I guess the point is always wide open that and be aware of the possibility that the thing could freeze up and appear to be shut off, but yet still have an issue. Zach, I have to bring up a point of order. I think air gas recommends that you don't empty the cylinder. They want that, you to return yes. it with a little positive. That, that is correct, that is correct. And it's a moisture and contamination issue. Correct. Yeah, I've, I, I've told them what I do, and they've never corrected me on that. Okay. The, the thought, on the heliums, I did leave gas in them for that reason. The hydrogens, it, for me, it's just easier to throw in the back of the Jeep. I leave the windows you know, cracked so while I'm at work and I'll deliver over my lunch hour or something like that. So that's why I do that procedure. Okay, so I'll stand corrected. You can order from air gas and others uh, gas of any type with different purity levels. If you have laboratory grade purity, for example, mm -hmm. yes, that becomes an issue. Yeah. If it's party helium, uh, probably no big deal at all. Uh, it's not lab grade, but it is uh, welding Sorry, grade. Yeah. yeah, I have the same exact thing. I, all I do is vent it out. I took it back. Uh, the last time I took tanks back, I told him I had just vented it out, let it run out. He says, that's great. He was happy that I didn't done it that way. So. Yeah, with the laboratory grade, there yes. actually is a fee if you vent it to the atmosphere. Well, I don't think anything we're telling them we want is lab grade, though. It's, no. They call it welder's grade, right? Uh, something like I think that. they call it welder's grade. 99.9 or yeah. 99. Okay. Yeah, our, our, air, our air gas supplier doesn't have a grade for, for hydrogen. They, they did for helium and, yeah. you know, they had medical grade and industrial grade, but for hydrogen they don't. Yeah, maybe. Okay, number 12. Uh, Larry, we'll let you start this one. Is there a training program for new fill crew members? And uh, what is the length of uh, tenure for those balloon fillers? Maybe you can comment on that too. Okay. Um, 
My assistants usually vary on who they are and whether they can come to the flight. I've got some that are pretty reliable and are there most of the time. Um, there is no class that I give on. I, I tried initially to do a safety briefing to everybody to make sure they understood, uh, you know, the, the explosiveness of hydrogen and the flammability levels and how it burns with a, uh, an invisible flame and you might not see it and, and so forth. And so I, I went through all of those things and explained a lot of things. And then when I got done with the safety briefing, then here comes somebody else. And I didn't have the time to go over that with them. And so it's kind of a hit and miss. The training program is really, okay, if you're interested in coming to help, then I'll start giving you some low-level positions. And then the more you come, then you're going to graduate and do more and more things. If you get in trouble, you'll go to the back of the line. <laughs> yeah, if you get in trouble, you'll go be a tracker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really do anything special either. If I have somebody on that's helping out that's never done it before, I kind of walk them through the same things just to make sure they know what's, what to expect and what's going on, and, uh, but that's it. Yeah, we don't have a 12-step program. We do kind of graduate to the people that are there every, uh, uh, every launch. Uh, they, they tend to be the neck handlers, the, the assistants, the, the valve guy. But that's, uh, it's purely Ours get informal. recruited as they show up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I need help now. Yeah, I, I like putting a, a, an experienced guy as the valve guy because the hydrogen, of course, has reverse threads. Yeah. And that messes with people's minds and they get... <laughs> They forget about that sometimes, so I try to put a more experienced guy on the tanks. Keith, you want to start with this one? What publications, presentations, manuals, et cetera, did your group use to develop your field process? <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we switched to hydrogen, I did look through all of this stuff, okay, all of the stuff that was online and all the stuff that you've contributed that's all on the uh, ARHAB website. But uh, I can't say that we developed anything because our procedures are damn near identical to what we did with uh, helium. I would agree with that. Uh, we're basically identical on the helium. Uh, GPSL two years ago, I did present on some hydrogen safety, some experiments that I had done. Uh, so that was a good learning process, getting more comfortable with, you know, intentionally abusing the gas and seeing what would happen. Uh, and no fire trucks were involved in that, but uh, <laughs> it. it my, my comfort level went way up after, after dealing with it and messing with it. Um, you know, I, I don't do it around a fire, fireman. Uh, they would really question some of the things that you're doing, but uh, uh, that's been the extent of it. I did, I did a lot of reading, uh, you know, back and forth of do you need a regulator, do you not need a regulator, what happens with static electricity and hose, all that. Um, I, I kind of came to my own conclusions and my own opinions of that. Um, but there was no one manual. Uh, Google was my friend. It all comes down to common sense. Yeah, I, I again uh, read everything I could on the internet, including uh, some stuff from the Weather Bureau, uh, National Weather Service on, on launching uh, balloons, etc. Uh, I watched your videos that you created with your little spark tests and your little mm -hmm. bags of hydrogen, and, and I will Thank you very much for that because that increased my confidence level in dealing with hydrogen in that it's really not dangerous. You just need to respect it like, uh, like other hazardous materials, and as long as you respect it, you're okay. So uh, my stuff that I developed was just reading material like that. Um, I also considered going with a, um, a grounded hose or a metallic hose. Um, I decided against that. I really didn't think it was necessary. It, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, static electricity is generated when two non-metallic substances separate. So I thought, well, okay, if there's static over there on the trailer where all the hydrogen tanks are, I don't necessarily want to <laughs> conduct it over here via metal hose to where I'm filling the balloon. So mm -hmm. I chose to go with a non-metallic hose to 
separate the two potentials. If there is any over here, I don't want it where I'm filling the balloon. So mm -hmm. that was my decision why I didn't go with that kind of a hose. There is one thing that I found on the National Weather Service. Of course, they, they fill indoors. Uh, and they, of course, want everything grounded, of course, indoors. But uh, we were very dry in Colorado. And I was a little more concerned about some static discharge, especially if you got the latex balloon and we have the tarp. So there's two non-metallic surfaces there. And when they separate, that creates static electricity when the, the balloon lifts off the, the tarp. So I was concerned about that. And the National Weather Service talked about misting the balloon during fill with water. So I went and got a, um, a little uh, garden sprayer, um, fill it with water, and I have the little valve set on uh, mist. So I kind of pump that up, and so we'll mist the tarp before, we, before the balloon goes onto the tarp, and then we'll mist the balloon slightly as we fill to uh, apparently cut down on that according to the weather service. And once the balloon is up in the air and is lifted off the tarp, I no longer mist because I really don't want to be sending a wet balloon <laughs> that might freeze or, uh, you know, cause icing or, or yeah. whatever. So if the temperature is below freeze, is cold, because we do launch in January and December and February, so it can be very cold in the mornings. If it's really, really cold, I won't mist. Uh, and obviously in Kansas, I'm not going to mist because I don't, you know, your humidity is way up there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, do, uh, I do mist with that. Number 14, uh, Larry, you want to start this one? Do you discuss the use of hydrogen with the groups you fly for? We're running really low on time. Can you, you want to? I just want to offer, SimSat uses the NWS uh, radio sign in um, its uh, appendix B. Uh, this is really important. It covers hydrogen gas. Uh, Federal Meteorological Handbook number three. And you can get a copy of it uh, by going to mysimsat.net, clicking on the CarolSat 2 mission, and scrolling to the bottom of the procedures that we cite. And it gives a lot of good information about hydrogen as well as okay. um, uh, safety. It would be great to get on the RHAB website. I think you have some of that already. Send me a link and I'll put it on the RHAB website. Simsat.net. Send me the whole thing if you want. You know, okay. Or just the link to that document. Okay. The, by far, the, the group that we fly the most for is the University <laughs> of Colorado. And they had a huge concern about using hydrogen because the students are around that. The students are holding the payloads as, as all of this goes up. So they had a, a, a real problem with this initially. Uh, they, uh, they were willing to pay for helium no matter what the cost because of that factor. But it got to the point where we couldn't get it at any cost, so we then had to switch to hydrogen. And uh, so these procedures were discussed with them, and uh, after the first one, no event, after second, no event, uh, now it's, they don't have an issue with it, everybody understands it, but we do, discuss it with, uh, with any group other than University of Colorado that doesn't know about it, just so that they understand to stay away from the balloon fill and they understand some potential hazards. So yes, we do discuss the use of hydrogen. I will tell them what's going on and give them some safety stuff, but we don't, I don't discuss it with them per se. Uh, it's, it's usually the parents that are afraid of it, not, <laughs> not the kids. The parents are, you know, the first thing that comes to their mind, I don't have to tell you, it starts with an H, right? Hindenburg. Well, you know, the first time you tell them that the Hindenburg didn't burn because of the hydrogen and burn because of the rocket fuel on the outside of the thing, they start to rethink things. So, but no, we don't really do that. We have not been flying with uh, any groups uh, since we switched over to hydrogen. It's just been us individually, so it uh, has not really been a factor for us. I mean, I guess I did have to do it with the Boy Scouts last year. I had to file some paperwork that showed that it was safe and why it was safe. But other than that, no. Uh, number 15, I'll start this one. What is the cost of your gas for your group to get hydrogen and or helium if available? Uh, helium is occasionally available. Uh, last time I priced it, I think it was uh, 
$150 or so per a bottle, um, and it's real hit and miss uh, for the GPSL. It was not available. It just, and that was several months ago. He just said, it, I can't get it for you. Uh, hydrogen, uh, this one was a little bit more because they're actually delivering it, uh, but it came out to be $55, $56 and some change. Uh, to deliver uh, the hydrogen bottles for us. If I go pick it up, it probably comes out to be upper 40s. Uh, when we uh, switched again to hydrogen, we discussed with air gas uh, what our prices were going to be. Uh, for John Q. Citizen off the street, if they even sell them hydrogen, they quoted $101 for a um, what they call their uh, 300 size cylinder, which is not quite 300 cubic feet, but close. So that was $101, but I negotiated a, an EOSS price down to $40.71. Um, however, we've, we do fly with the University of Colorado. They have a contract with air gas for various things, and their price that they can get it for uh, is substantially less than $40 a cylinder. So um, they usually pay for their credit card and on their account, and I just pick it up under their name. Uh, I have a comment on the pricing. Uh, turned out, uh, if you go to the local big, big brand uh, air gas or any of those kind of things, sometimes, if, particularly if you're, they don't know you, a healing can be $400 a tank. Uh, hydrogen is around 100 but if you negotiate, you can usually get it down around 55 for the hydrogen tank. I found that going to a mom and pop welding store, I can often get helium for $140 for you a know, 300 cubic foot tank and hydrogen right around 45 to 50. So sometimes you can negotiate a better deal, particularly if you just absolutely have to use helium with a mom and pop local store rather than the air gas people who just don't want to sell to anybody but their existing customers. Our university has a big contract when we do our school flights. Uh, it's right around the 300 cubic foot uh, helium tank, and they have to do helium, uh, is uh, right around 90, 92 bucks. But they have a big contract, they buy a lot of gas. So. Can I ask a quick question? Do you understand? Is there a comment on one of the emails on the GPSL side? <laughs> which said that the um, Totex and um, latex balloons could only really be put down onto polythene sheets rather than tarpaulins. I was just wondering whether that created any increased risk of um, electrostatic buildup, because it's the kind of thing that um, I actually bought a polythene sheet with it. So. Mm -hmm. it uh, I was going to comment a little bit on what we lay ours on, too. I mean, when we blow, do our balloons, we actually lay it on a sheet bed sheet. Usually, I, I think there's a, the top one we always use is cotton. I think the other one is some kind of polyester. But it's laying on top of a, of a, um, a tarp just to keep the moisture out. Maybe we shouldn't do that. We should let the moisture come through. But, and then we put two sheets on top and we put the balloon on top of that. I've never heard of anybody saying there's a recommended... Uh, one of the emails on GPSL. Okay. Bill? Uh, Joe, my chain in uh, Wisconsin, he's been flying hydrogen tank and all, everything sits on that, and so it's at the same potential of where the balloon is. He never has a ground rain, and he's never had problems. He's inflated inside of farms with poor circulation, so... Uh, That's a good idea. Uh, but if you are in an inside building, make sure it is a barn and has holes in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I will say, uh, this is good to get the word out, because I was at the Dayton Hand Bench and talking to some students that had made their own zero pressure balloon. It was a 7,000 cubic foot plastic, made out of plastic drop cloth. And it has a vent hole in the bottom. It's a zero pressure balloon. And uh, they were, I was looking at them and said, yeah, they look pretty. They said it had some holes in it, so it leaked. So it went up, went about 30,000 feet, and it came down. It was laying out in the field, still with a lot of gas in it. At that point, I said, well, how much gas did you put in? 600 cubic foot of hydrogen. Like, uh -huh. I <laughs> Did you imagine a polyethylene bag open to outside air, sucking in oxygen, 
uh, just laying there in a the needle. So they were lucky. So I said, from now on. <laughs> I, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend that, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back to this. Uh, I think our last tank of gas we bought was just over $50 for the hydrogen. He did tell me if I wanted to get uh, helium, it would be over $400, but he couldn't get it to me anyway. So. <laughs> All right, uh, last question. Um, have you had any incidents with hydrogen that you're willing to public ad publicly admit to? Uh, no, I'll start that. Uh, we have not. Um, Yet. Well, publicly admit to. <laughs> now, we, we've, we've had no problems. Uh, we, we open the valve, we put the gas in the envelope, we seal the envelope up. It's gone. I have no, had no issues. I'm still here, and all my hair's here. I'm good. Uh, I, I lost all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that when you were talking about the hoodie and everything. It's like, really? What are you? Uh... <laughs> uh, no, we've had no incidents with hydrogen at all. In fact, it's been so uneventful that I think uh, our concern, my concern, is complacency. Uh, that everybody's like, well, nothing's going to happen. This is this is okay, and some of the safety things aren't going to be followed, or people may not be wearing the proper safety equipment and so forth. So, I need to stay on top of that to make sure that we are being safe, even though I think we might be at the complacency level now. We've had nothing either way, well, that I'm willing to admit or not willing to admit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are way behind time. Um, I guess uh, if we have a couple questions, we can take a couple questions, but uh, we've got to keep moving on with the next uh, presenter, which is you. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'll bring it up and make a motion. We extend five minutes if we have to, since safety is so important. Uh, but I wanted to make two points based on the NWS handbook mm -hmm. about fire extinguishers on hand. Uh, at the site for hydrogen. Uh, first Here. of all, well, let's get this recorded since. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. N8PK. First of all, uh, they do recommend that there is at least a 20 pound um, fire extinguisher on hand, if not more, because when you do have a fire, you find out those small things, how quickly um, yep. uh, you use the thing up. Uh, the second thing is they make it a point to make sure you know, and they use the shell knot, uh, use a fire extinguisher to extinguish a hydrogen-fed fire because of the chemical reaction of the um, extinguisher chemicals. Now, you still want to extinguish a fire, but a sec something secondary that's on fire, of mm -hmm. course, it's fair game. Mm -hmm. And the exact wording is in that Appendix B which I'll send you a link to. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Excellent, well thank you, uh, good participation and uh, thank you Larry, Keith.